Well, good morning. Um, as you know, we have a state of emergency issued in Florida for all 67 uh, counties. The precise path of the storm is, is still somewhat uncertain, and, and that's the reason for, for all 67. Uh, but the intensity of the storm, I think there's a pretty high degree of certainty that this is going to be uh, a major hurricane, uh, Category 4, potentially even Category 4 plus. Yesterday, uh, we submitted a request to the federal government for pre-landfall declaration for assistance for protective measures. Uh, we anticipate getting a positive response on that. That request has been endorsed by all the entire Florida delegation uh, in the U.S. Congress, and we appreciate them uh, for their support on that. Uh, Floridians need to be prepared. Uh, you know, the, the bad news of the storm going slower is that that could uh, potentially have some, some negative impacts once it reaches landfall, uh, but you do have time before it reaches uh, to prepare if you have not done so. And so we urge all Floridians uh, to have uh, seven days worth of food, medicine, and water. Uh, this is potentially a multi-day event where it will churn slowly across the state. Uh, that obviously creates a whole host of issues, but if you're in an area that ha has an impact from this storm, you know, you should assume you're going to lose power. Uh, if you're in, in an area that flooded during Hurricane Irma and you're impacted by this, you should assume uh, that you're going to see flooding again after this storm. Uh, so be prepared and be prepared for potentially a multi-day event. Now, local officials are making determinations, I think, today about uh, evacuations, whether to issue evacuations and, and how you're going to do those evacuations. Um, we are just asking Floridians, please heed those directives from your local folks. Uh, they're uh, considering a variety of factors and obviously monitoring the storm's path. And uh, so those decisions are not made lightly. But if you're in an evacuation zone and you're ordered to evacuate, uh, please do so. Put your safety first. Um, better to evacuate and then it not end up um, hitting you uh, than to, to remain in there and end up being in, in jeopardy of, uh, of loss of life. Know if you're in an evacuation zone. Know which zone you're in and know your evacuation route. Now, we, in terms of our highways here, uh, the Florida Department of Transportation has already cleared the shoulders of all our major highways, like I-95 and I-75. And so they've been swept, cleared. Uh, we will open those shoulders for traffic once evacuation orders uh, are handed down. Uh, at uh, the DOT has not identified any abnormal traffic uh, patterns, uh, but obviously we know that, um, you know, once counties make determinations for evacuation orders, you know, you're going to see people uh, start to get on the road. Uh, Non-essential lane closures that reduce capacity throughout the state are being opened uh, to deal with the storm. Uh, fuel uh, is, is an issue. There's um, gas stations that, that have run out of fuel. Uh, we, in the emergency declaration, wait service and truck rates for fuel trucks so that we can increase the capacity of fuel that's being brought in. Uh, we're also going to be uh, starting today implementing uh, Florida Highway Patrol escorts for fuel trucks so we can facilitate refueling in critical parts of the state. I mean, there's some parts of the state where you have major lines for gas, cars are lined up. It makes it more difficult for the trucks to get in and, and replenish the, the gas supply. Uh, so we think those escorts will help, uh, help with that. Uh, we have a lot of fuel in Florida, it's just we have limited capacity to bring it from the port uh, to the gas stations because you can only have so many trucks at one time doing that. And so recognizing that, uh, we've worked with FEMA to get uh, fuel uh, from out of state. Uh, so FEMA and Jared have worked with Mississippi, Alabama, and Georgia to waive their service and truck weights uh, so we can facilitate fuel coming in from out of state. Um, and so that is um, yeah, happening as we speak. You know, in terms of these nursing homes, obviously that's been an issue in the past. Uh, the Agency for Healthcare Administration is making site visits or calls uh, to all facilities where the state does not have updated info about generators. Um, as you know, we now have a website through the Agency of Healthcare Administration where you can go in each county and see who's got the generators, who doesn't. Um, and so we think it's statewide, um, about what, 120, um, that, that we don't have the 
the information for. So there's going to be site checks. There's going to be phone calls to make sure that they have a plan uh, to deal uh, with folks that, that are in their care. And then once the storm passes, uh, there'll be spot checks done in conjunction with the Department of Health uh, to see uh, where there may be needs uh, well, after the storm and see who has lost power. Uh, the website uh, for uh, the ACA generator is just fl-generator.com. And so we've been putting that out to the local folks in our counties and uh, the emergency offices there uh, so that they have a sense of where they may need to, to offer assistance. And we encourage everyone to take a look at that. Uh, today, in my direction, Volunteer Florida activated the Florida Disaster Fund, the official private fund established to assist Florida's communities as they respond to and recover during times of emergency or disaster. And to donate, uh, please visit www.volunteerflorida.org or text DISASTER to 20222 uh, to make a $10 contribution, and we appreciate that. Uh, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission is preparing officers and resources for potential deployments in the coming days using a variety of specialized equipment, including shallow draft boats, ATVs, airboats, and four-wheel drive vehicles. Jared has also uh, requested uh, vehicles from the federal government that are able to um, navigate some potentially flooded streets, um, and obviously General Eifert is, um, is sensitive to that as well. I mean, you know, you, you're looking at potentially significant water event you know throughout major portions of the state um, and so we we want resources to be able to navigate that uh, there have been a number of school closures daytona state college eastern florida state college indian river state college valencia college seminole state college university of central florida florida atlantic florida polytechnic florida international and the university of central florida have issued clo closures starting today through tuesday uh, the school district in Martin County and Volusia County have also announced closures for Tuesday, September 3rd. As you know, Monday is Labor Day, so the schools were scheduled to be closed uh, anyways. Uh, our Florida Department of Economic Opportunity is extending the deadline for local governments to submit applications for the $85 million Rebuild Florida Infrastructure Repair Program. And Visit Florida has activated the Expedia Visit Florida Hotel Accommodation web portal so that if there is evacuation orders, you can get a sense of, of what would be available in terms of um, in terms of accommodations. Uh, we have um uh, close to a million gallons of water. Uh, Jared has requested, I think, another two, two million for FEMA. We have almost two million meals ready for distribution. Um, now, we have not necessarily received requests for that yet, but we stand ready to, uh, to distribute the, the meals um, when we can. Um, and the state, and then we're also working with um, some of the retailers like Publix and Walmart, you know, to make sure that their stocks are reshelved. We do not want them giving the state the water. We want that water going back on the shelves because a lot of people are, are preparing, which is good, but obviously the flip side of that is the water's going off the shelf and, 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 and requires restocking uh, in a quicker fashion. Uh, if you want up-to-date information on Hurricane Dorian, please visit floridadisaster.org slash info uh, for local media updates and, and, and updates as we do. You can do my Twitter account. You can also do the state emergency response Twitter account, which is at FLSERT. Um, and the state is also activating a toll-free hotline for Floridians to receive information. And that number is 1-800-342-3557. So this is a uh, major event. Uh, we still have some degree of uncertainty, but I think if you look at the different forecasts, you see uh, potential major impacts from places in South Florida, potentially going all the way uh, up the coast of Florida. Uh, some forecasts have it going through the center of the state, uh, similar to kind of what, 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 what Irma did in terms of going up the middle. Um, and you still have some forecasts that say it's going to go across the state and end up in the Gulf of, of Mexico. So we just got to be prepared uh, for all those uh, circumstances. I think the probabilities of all those are not necessarily equal, uh, but it's much better to be prepared and, um, and then not have to face 
face it than, than to go into one of these things uh, unprepared. Um, and finally, I, I, I did speak with the president um, on uh, Wednesday night, um, and the administration has been great, um, and they've assured us they're going to uh, provide uh, all the resources we need. Uh, the president was scheduled to leave the country um, and has canceled that trip because uh, I think the administration recognizes that this is a really, really serious event. Uh, and with that, we're happy to take some questions for myself or Jared or the general. Governor, what's the status of the National Guard? General Eifert, they're, sure. they're, they're mobilizing. We are mobilizing as we speak. Uh, we expect about 2,000 soldiers and airmen from the Florida National Guard mobilized by the end of day today. By the end of the day tomorrow, it'll probably be doubled by about 4,000. We're trying to be um, responsive but not uh, overzealous in uh, implementing whatever uh, requirements the uh, Department of Emergency Management levies on us. So uh, we're prepared to respond. We have 12,000 soldiers and airmen in the state, and every one of them that is um, able and uh, in in uh, the state, not deployed, will be uh, ready to uh, step up as needed. In addition, we have uh, emergency management assistance compacts with various states in the southern region, especially to be able to fill in any voids that we have or gaps in our formations that might need specialties like aviation, engineering, high water vehicle transportation, and those kinds of things. Governor. And we also, um, uh, the general's talking with other states. We anticipate getting uh, support from other states. I know I spoke with uh, the governor of Alabama, and she authorized some National Guard personnel from Alabama. Uh, so, so that is ongoing, and I'm sure we will provide those updates once we get them. Governor, yes. Uh, uh, this is just an observation. I noticed there's a lot more FEMA personnel in the EOC, and obviously the, the trucks that were previously across the street at D, uh, DFS are now right here in the parking lot. Um, is this a change on, on your part with the, you know, with the new administration, or is just is this just happenstance, or is it a new approach? I guess. I think this is just what we planned, right? Yeah. No, I mean, I, I, I'm not exactly familiar in terms of how FEMA did in terms of where they were before I was here. But, you know, when we did uh, the hurricane uh, exercise, I mean, this is how we've uh, how we've anticipated it happening. And, um, you know, Jared has developed a really good relationship with folks in FEMA, um, and they really appreciate all the hard work he's doing. So so I think we're on the same page, and I think we'll be able to work constructively together. Governor, this is your first uh, major hurricane as governor, and I'm wondering if there was much of a learning curve for you going into this and do you see like your political future sort of tied to how the state performs during this I don't view it politically at all we're trying to to protect the state protect people and um, and assist these local folks who are out there you know they're all activated now um, as best we could um, you know I grew up in Florida so I'm not a uh, uh, stranger to hurricanes and of course we've had a number of active hurricane seasons recently uh, as a US congressman we had hurricane Matthew uh, where my district was the district that was most affected. Now, granted, that could have been worse than, than the path it ultimately took. Um, and then, obviously, Hurricane Irma, that affected almost everybody in the state. Um, and so, you know, I have um, a lot of experience just understanding kind of how, how some of the wheels uh, go in motion. And then we've done an awful lot with, with Hurricane Michael uh, since I've taken office. And so this is something that we didn't want to see hurricane this season. I know Jared and I both uh, did what we thought we could in different, different respects to, to try to head that off, but we also prepared for one and, um, uh, you know, did a major hurricane exercise. Uh, you know, I would ask Jared, hey, what's it look like in the Caribbean? What's this? Because we knew that this is something that could potentially happen. So um, at the end of the day, you know, we're going to be working really, really hard uh, uh, to do our best uh, to help the folks uh, in the state of Florida. Governor, what can you tell us about uh, cell phone coverage and how long people should expect to go out? That was a big problem, at least for some providers after uh, Hurricane Mike. And that's what everyone's on, and going to want to know about how their their home. Sure. Well, out. obviously, I think in Michael, it's a major problem, um, and uh, and it really hindered, I think, the ability for for folks to be able to take protective measures after the storm. But uh, we've spoken with companies like Verizon. Uh, you know, they have a plan. They are implementing the plan. They recognize uh, you know the threat from the storm um, and, and are taking action. And so uh, that's really at the end of the day, you know, these are private companies. Uh, 
what we've done, Jared's talked to him, I've talked to him, and said, look, the state really believes that um, you know having a plan and being able to take action to restore any lost service as quickly as possible is very important. Helps with the recovery efforts, helps with people uh, whose livelihoods are at stake. And I think they all get that, and I think they, they recognize some of the problems in the past. Um, and I would say the same with, with the utilities. Uh, I've met with a number of the heads of the utilities, uh, uh, companies like Florida Power and Light, and they are executing their plans. And you're seeing a lot of assets being brought to bear in Florida right now. Uh, not necessarily for sure where those are going to need to ultimately be deployed, but there's going to be a capacity to do that. And restoring the power uh, once it goes out to as many people as quickly as possible, that helps Jared, me, it helps General, it helps with the recovery effort um, and the response. Um, and so we're, we're sensitive to that. And I can say that the, the utilities have plans. They are, they are executing those plans. Resources are being brought to bear. Um, and, uh, and I think that that's, that's a responsible thing to do. Governor, Facebook has started a new tool for first responders to alert communities in case of emergency. Do you have any idea if the state government or any of the local governments might be using this new tool? I'll let Jared um, weigh in on that. Governor, thank you. Uh, I don't know specifically about the face, Facebook new tool, but I know we're constantly using social media, uh, all different aspects of social media, all different ways of communication. Uh, but I can get back to you specifically on the, on, on the Facebook issue. Thank you. The, the gas is an issue every time we have a hurricane. It is, and a consultant's report earlier this year recommended increasing the capacity at, these term, at the terminals loading in the trucks. I mean, do you think that or other issues will seriously have to be addressed after this storm? Well, let's just see. I mean, Jared and I have talked um, earlier this year about do we want a state fuel reserve or, or and we've kicked around different ideas. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, we're utilizing the capacity we have here and then we're going outside the state to increase the, the capacity now. Um, and I think part of the reason why you've seen, uh, I mean, Fort Myers is, um, I think they're at like 47% of the gas stations there, um, basically the same as Miami. And Miami, man, there were lines everywhere. There. There. Um, I think part of that is because I think people are taking steps to be prepared, uh, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, so we, um, we're doing all we can on the fuel. I understand it's something that's very sensitive to me because I remember running around with these hurricanes throughout my life, and, and that's something that, that people really want to see uh, there. So the FHP is going to be escorting some of that fuel uh, very shortly, and we hope that that makes a positive impact. What about people in tiny about homes and tents in North Florida? I know that the hurricane shows that it can get out into the Gulf. Um, are they, should they just evacuate? What should those people well, do? So that's going to be a determination with the local officials that they make as they monitor the storm. Obviously, a storm that cuts across the state ends up in the Gulf of Mexico, then slams the panhandle is a bad, bad thing for us because of what you cite. I mean, you have blue tarps on a lot of these houses still in places like Bay County. And so having a major impact uh, less than a year after Michael uh, is something that, that, that we hope does not happen. Um, it's still too soon to tell whether that's happening. And as I say, not every path of this storm has the same probability, but you got to be prepared for that. And I think those uh, those communities are going to have to to make those decisions. Obviously, Jared, myself, when you know, if we become convinced that that there's a, a real threat there, you know, we're certainly going to communicate that um, in there. But I think it's too soon to tell. But 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 clearly, that's um, you know th that that's a concern for us. And I think that's a, been a concern for us from the beginning. Yeah. And there are also other parts. I mean, if you look at um, you know, we we were when, when our briefing today, uh, Jared was outlining some of the areas. You know, in South Florida, where you have more transient communities and in different parts, um, and 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 that that is something that, that that is a concern for us. And so you see that in places like Palm Beach County um, and some of the interior parts. So um, you know, fortunately, I think I think Palm Beach d d does a good job. But but that is just that is a concern when you have some of these um, some of these storms hit like this. Do you feel that the state to the, uh, Could you speak to the decision to move the FSU game rather than cancel it all outright? Well, I, I think at the end of the day, um, you know, Jacksonville wrestled with whether they wanted to, to play the game there. Uh, moving it to Friday, they may have issued an evacuation order three hours before the game. So if you have a, a game in Jacksonville, 
how does that impact the evacuation uh, of parts of, of Jacksonville or Duval County or other parts of the state? So I think that the mayor um, and the university officials, uh, I think they made a good decision to do it. I think doing it Saturday, you know, we're not anticipating impacts on this thing until sometime Sunday. So I think having it in Tallahassee, you can do the game, and I think people would still have the ability to, um, to get where they need to go. Obviously, this is an uncertain track, um, but I think the probabilities are are that Jacksonville 95 area is going to be more likely to see a lot of people leaving than maybe over here and I-10. And so, so I think it was a good decision, and I think it'll make it easier for folks in Jacksonville to be able to manage whatever uh, types of um, evacuations uh, uh, need to occur. Are you looking to avoid the kind of big mass evacuation that occurred during Irma? Do you think that was a bad idea to just sort of tell the state to get out of town? Well, it's, it's the type of thing where uh, we want you, if you're in an evacuation zone, if, if you have um, an order come down, so if you're in Brevard County and they t say evacuate the barrier islands, they're not going to do that lightly. I mean, they're doing that because they're anticipating really significant storm surge that can be life-threatening. They're anticipating a massive amounts of flooding. Um, and so we want you to heed those calls. Um, but I think there's also the, the case of sometimes, you know, if you evacuate too soon, you may evacuate into a path of the storm as it changes. And so these things are just, I think the counties are wrestling with this. The fact that the impacts are not going to happen as early as I think we initially anticipated means they're taking the time to kind of digest what that would mean um, and then making those decisions. And so uh, you will see evacuations. I'm, I'm confident of that. Um, but to just willy nilly tell every state, you know, we're not going to be telling every county, tell everybody, everybody to leave because that, that may, may create some problems as well. So um, um, uh, but, but I think it's really going to be determinative on some of the local issues and local factors. Um, and it's interesting, if you look down the east coast of Florida, you know, some of those barrier islands are much more vulnerable than other parts of the east, east Florida coast. I mean, that's just the reality of the situation. And so, you know, you may have a quicker trigger on areas that really are um, potentially problematic. Uh, what we want to do at the state level is obviously uh, assist the efforts. If people, if there are evacuations, we're going to waive the tolls. We're going to open up the shoulders. We're going to do things uh, to make that a more orderly process. And if we feel strongly that a local community is not acting in a way that makes sense, you know, we will certainly let them know what we what we think. But at the same time, you know, I really uh, trust a lot of those local folks to really know, you know, what's best for their communities, because this is not like this is their first rodeo at this point. I mean, we've had multiple seasons of this. I mean, a lot of people on the East Coast were concerned with Matthew, Irma concerned almost everybody um, and so we're going to um, you know we're, we're going to tell people really focus on on the news coming out of your your local emergency officials. Is the state talking to federal officials about prisoners? I've seen in Miami is not rated for a category three storm. Obviously some of these are federal facilities but what are you guys doing about prisoners? Well we're on our facilities that was actually one of my concerns because I'm like you know and, and, and basically the prisoners are put into uh, facilities that can withstand um, you know impacts and so so you will We'll see prisoners uh, moved around and um, you know that was done with Hurricane Michael and and it was done relatively uneventfully um, and so that that's what's going to have to happen uh, this time in terms of the federal we're not really um, uh, going to take federal prisoners I don't think there's a plan for that uh, because I think they obviously have their own facilities and, and, and are responsible for those for those inmates. Um, not also on FEMA funding, you might remember when you were up in Congress that there is, there's a bit of a delay in the, in the way that FEMA can get the money down to the states, then they can, they can distribute it. I think there's like two or three, there's like two or three weeks for a month that, that Congress or the Senate can actually sit on the money and debate about it. Some members will actually use it to say that they got all this money. Um, with this storm coming, do you know if, uh, if there's any interest in actually kind of removing this? and? to get money down to the state faster or? Well, Jared can speak about what we've done. Now, remember, some of the money 
was FEMA, but some of the money was there were processes here that, that were not uh, working effectively as well. But, but Jared can talk about what we're doing there. And just one more question after this. Please. So I've already addressed that with FEMA about the money that is in, uh, at the CRC for approval and in OLA review. I've also talked to uh, our delegation about that. And so uh, FEMA is already uh, communicating with me about the dollars that they're going to push down because obviously as counties and cities have to respond, they, we want to make sure that they have the resources to do so, which is why you know, obviously over the last seven and a half months, eight months, uh, we've pushed now more than $800 million down to the local government. It's more money than the division has ever moved uh, in its history. Over $150 million of the Citrus Block Grant program has been moved, uh, you know, uh, under uh, under Governor DeSantis. So uh, I, I am looking at that, and FEMA is cooperating, getting that money out faster. You mentioned that there were millions of meals and that there was a lot of water being stockpiled. Where are those stockpiles at? Are they going to be centrally located or are they out of state ready to move in? Uh, I mean, I know some of them are in central Florida, but Jared could probably tell you where all those are. Yeah, so they're, they're, they're in our warehouse in, in Orlando. We, we stockpile both the water and the food there, and then it becomes a, a massive distribution center. We also have multiple vendors uh, ready to go to, to distribute uh, all sorts of different commodities, including water and food. What triggers that? When do you decide it's time to distribute? So there, there's a lot of things. Right now I'm gathering commodities. As counties request things, we push them down. They put in those requests, and then we fulfill uh, all the needs or any unmet needs that they may have. But we haven't, we haven't received uh, any requests up to this point from the counties, and, but we stand ready to fulfill those requests. Yeah, we have no, we received no requests for any food. We've been moving water to them over the last couple of days out of the warehouse. So I'm going to be, I, I think we're going to get, I got to get running. I'm going to go down um, and meet with the, the folks in, in Palm Beach County uh, today. I'm also going to tour kind of the, uh, the, the super storm facility for FPNL get a sense of the assets that they're bringing to bear uh, to help get the, get the power back on. Um, and then we're going to be going to Central Florida, I think, to Orange County, uh, visiting with the emergency officials here. Uh, but my intention is to, to end up back here. Uh, so we'll probably have another briefing uh, sometime um, late afternoon, early evening here in Tallahassee. So thank you.